Uh, several of us here in this congregation, along with some others from uh, Cornerstone, have been to the country of Haiti. It's been several years. But we worked with uh, Sunlight Christian Academy there. And since that time, Cole Run Church of Christ has taken on Sunlight and some of the missionaries there to uh, provide support for them in the church and in the Christian school and the Bible college that they have there. And if you watch the news any time lately, you've seen that Haiti is a very troubled country. There are many, many difficulties going on there, starting with their financial problems, their government problems. And because of that, uh, if you've noticed, one of the big things is that there's a lack of any type of fuel for vehicles or uh, any kind of transportation, any kind of shipping that might be coming in there. And so much of the country is in a political unrest and many of the people are very dissatisfied. They've taken to the streets, there's rioting, there's burning of things. And uh, it's becoming a very serious situation in that country. Many of our missionaries are affected by the same thing that affects the, the rest of the people in Haiti. Lack of fuel, which means uh, at sunlight, they cannot run generators, so they have lack of electricity, which means they have difficulty keeping their food stuffs preserved without any type of refrigeration. They've reduced the school hours, and in some places have actually cut back the school uh, days. So there are many difficulties that our missionaries face when a country like Haiti has other problems of its own. And so I just want you to be aware that we do support them and that we need to keep that country and keep our missionaries there in our prayers. Uh, pretty difficult when you don't have fuel to get around, don't have electricity, eventually you run out of food, you run out of everything you need to live. And so that makes it very difficult to be able to continue on with the work there. So we're going to take a few moments this morning and ask that uh, we take about... Uh, 15 seconds and for you to have a silent prayer in your own mind for the people in Haiti and for our missionaries there and then Brother Steve Sloan will lead us in prayer together after we have a silent prayer. So let's all pray right now for Haiti. Father, we do come to you this morning lifting up the work that's being done in Haiti. Father, we know it's a, an island country that is suffering many, many problems from natural problems, natural storms that hit the island. Father, to the government officials, Father, they just have problems that need to be worked out, and only you can work them out. And Father, we pray for Sunlight Christian Ministry that's trying to do the work uh, for you in that nation. Father, the work that they do is, is a great work. And Father, it needs to be supported, and we're thankful, Lord, that we're able to support it in some little way. But Father, we lift them up to you this morning. We lift up all the people that are there that are teaching that are leading the people the children father we lift up the people of haiti the children and also their parents father we pray that your will is done in their lives father just continue to bless them as they try to reach the whole nation of haiti father in the name of jesus we thank you, Father, for all you do, and everything you do, we give you the praise and the honor for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody out this morning. Would you stand with us as we prepare to worship and song this morning? We're leading off with Blessed Be Your Name. I think everybody knows this one, and let's just lift up our praise to the Lord, the one who is the most high and who rules over all. Yes, 
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, with streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. The walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in on Still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious
Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for another day that you've blessed us with, Father. We know that it may be dreary outside and raining, but the sun is shining in here, Father. Amen. We thank you for sending your Son so that we have hope of eternal life. And that's why we're all here today, Father, to worship you and lift up your name for all the good things you do for us that we don't deserve. We ask you please be with this service. Help it be uplifting to your name. And if there's somebody here in attendance who doesn't know you as their personal Savior, please help them to make their decision for you today. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. <laughs> Appreciate that. <clears throat> yes, good morning. I'm okay. That actually ties in really good with what I was getting ready to say, so uh, we'll, we'll just go with that. I don't know about you guys, but th this weather, it's just terrible, isn't it? It's terrible. It makes my back hurt, and I've had a headache, and my sinuses, and just... Oh, and you know, we, when we went to Tennessee there yesterday with the kids, the weather was just awful. Driving in the rain, you know, it makes you so tired and just, oh, just, it's, it's just tiring. It was so cold outside. My ears were cold out in the rain, and, and the kids were just kind of wild, you know, and every, my kids, not the other kids. The kids were just wild and just loud and into everything. And then we went to Chick fil A, and we had to wait. Can you believe that? We had to wait to get a table. Kelly didn't even have a seat, she had to stand there. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just terrible. It was all these bad things. Obviously, I'm overemphasizing that a lot, but it's real easy to complain, isn't it? It's real easy to, to be upset about things not being exactly the way we want them to be. We all want 72 and sunshine, right? But, but, we, but we want our comfortable seats. We want the lighting just, you know, we want it bright enough we can see, but not so bright that it hurts our eyes, right? We want the humidity just right, that way it's not too, it's cool, but it's sticky, you know, we don't want that. We want the sunshine, but we don't want it so bright that it hurts our eyes, or if we do, we want our sunglasses, right? It's really easy to complain when things aren't exactly the way that we have them envisioned to be. It's really easy to complain when things don't go exactly the way that we want them to, or if maybe we don't feel the best, or maybe if things aren't exactly as planned. Our Lord knows about that, don't he? Our Lord knows about that. Now, we talk about the weather and stuff. We know the Lord knows what we need, right? We know we need, he knows when we need rain. We know we needed rain, right? We know that uh, you know, the Lord knows those things. But our Lord Jesus knows even more about it than we can even begin to imagine, right? Because we know what he went through. We know that he went to Calvary's cross to die for us. We know that he was literally and physically nailed to a cross, right? And we know that this is our Lord that we're talking about, right? This is the Son of God who lived a perfect life, who never sinned, the opposite of us, right? We, who lived this life for us. So he, could, he was the Son of God. He lived all these things perfectly. So he knew all this that was in plan from the beginning, right? He knew that he was going to die on a cross, right? And we knew that, you know, he, he's on God's team. He's the, he's the captain of God's team, I guess we could say. And we knew that he, that's what he wanted to do, right? right? Not really. He, he knew what was going to happen, but he didn't want to, did he? What did our Lord say? Luke 22, verse 41 and following, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. When we see that, we see that our Lord, just like us, he had no more desire for painful things or things that didn't go the way that he wanted them to any more than we would, right? Ah, oh, but it's the next line that means the most, right? It's the next line that Jesus says that means the most to you, to I, to our eternity, to our eternal salvation. When Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's really easy to complain. It's really easy to be upset. It's really easy to be bent out of shape when things don't go the way that we want them to. It's really easy to get focused on all the negatives and miss what all God has done for us. 
Jesus came to earth. Earth is a beautiful place, right? God made us a beautiful world to live in and sights to see and things to do. He did all these things for our enjoyment. A lot of them are purely, I believe, for our enjoyment, right? That God made this world for us to live in. And he sent his son here to live with us. And it's a glorious place. It doesn't compare to heaven, but it's still a great place to come. But Jesus didn't come here just to live, did he? Jesus didn't come just to see the sights, just to see the Red Sea or, or, or the pyramids of Giza or whatever else is in the Middle East that I can't think of off the top of my head. But Jesus didn't come just to see those things, did he? Jesus came to die. And he knew it. And he went through with it. Even though he didn't want to. Even though it wasn't pleasant. When we go through our life, we need to remember these things as we go. We need to remember to keep our chin up, to not let the things that maybe seem a little out of sorts to us get us down. We need to focus on the positives. And more importantly, as we come around the Lord's table, we remember what Jesus did for us. He didn't want to die on a cross any more than you or I would, but he wanted to do his Father's will. He wanted us to experience eternity in heaven with him and with God. And the only way to do that was not thy will, Father, not my will, Father, but thine be done. Remember that as we gather around the Lord's table this morning. Your only Son. another portion of your word proclaimed and to meet around your table. Lord, I pray that you would bless this loaf that represents the body of Christ that gave his life upon Calvary's cross for each of us. Will you go with us throughout our service and be with the speaker of the hour, Lord? I pray if there's one here without Christ, Lord, they would make that uh, necessary appointment with him. In Jesus' name I pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this, uh, another Lord's day that you've given us, another day of life you have blessed us with, Father, and this uh, opportunity that we have this first day of the week to assemble here in your house and meet around your table and do those things you command us to do on the first day of each week. And Father, we thank you that uh, we can see the love that you have for us and you have 
proclaimed it through your son Jesus, the Lamb of God. You give him to us when we were sinners to die for our sins. And Father, we're just so thankful for that. We're thankful for that precious blood that he shed at Calvary's cross. It's the power in that blood that cleanses us from our sins. Not only our sins here, but all around the world. And Father, we thank you as we gather around this table today to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And we just thank you for this cup, Father, that uh, represents the blood that he shed there on Calvary's cross for each of us. And be with us as we partake here today. For it's in Jesus' loving name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
I hope you noticed in your bulletin this morning a, an insert in regard to a Christmas program we're going to present here in a couple months. Uh, we'd like for you to be involved in that Christmas program in a lot of different ways that you can be involved. So uh, just fill out that insert, uh, check off the things that you would be willing to do uh, to celebrate Jesus coming to save us from our sins. Uh, put your name on it and put it in the offering tray. And that, that will help uh, Brittany to uh, make plans for the Christmas program. As we uh, worship in giving, we're going to have a worship song on uh, a video. And it's a new song that uh, the praise team is working on. It's entitled, Who You Say I Am. And in fact, it's probably the most popular worship song that is being sung in uh, churches today. Who You Say I Am. So sing along.
This morning we are continuing our series of messages from the book of Ephesians in Christ alone with a message entitled Commonwealth. And our text comes from Ephesians chapter 2. We were there last Sunday, looked at the first uh, 10 verses, and now we're going to look at verses 11 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Father and God, we are so thankful for all the riches of the blessings of God that we have in Christ and in His glorious church that is founded upon Him and His apostles and prophets who laid the foundation in giving us the New Testament, the apostles and pro prophets that were used by You, our Father, to reveal to us the truth and the grace of the New Covenant. And we are so blessed to live on this side of the cross and we are so thankful that you are still building today men and women, boys and girls from all over the world, red, yellow, black, and white, you're bringing us all together in one body, the church, and reconciling us all through obedient faith in Christ into a right relationship with you. We know sin cut us off. We know at one time we were aliens and foreigners. But now we're fellow citizens, joint heirs with Christ of the glorious riches of the kingdom of God. So thank you, Father, for what you have done and are doing in us and through us. And for those who do not know you as Father, who do not know your Son as Savior and Lord, we pray that today they'll make a decision to come to Christ, to come to his church to come to His salvation, to be partakers of His Spirit, and to be a part of that one body, that one Spirit, and to enjoy with us the one hope of our calling in Christ. We ask it in His name. Amen. A teacher of a first grade class was practicing arithmetic one day, and she asked her class this simple question. If you had one dollar and you asked your dad for another dollar, how many dollars would you have? Little Tommy raised his hand and said, one dollar. And the teacher said, Tommy, you don't know your math. And Tommy said, teacher, you don't know my dad. <laughs> and so Paul wants his readers to know that they have a generous father who is willing and ready to give generous, rich gifts 
to his children on a regular basis. In fact, he begins Ephesians with praising God for all the blessings that we have, all those spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And we began this series of messages with a sermon entitled, Richer Than You Think. He also wants his readers to understand that our Father does not play favorites. He does not show partiality to one group of his children over another. And first century Christians had a hard time accepting that fact. They had a hard time with it. And today, 21st century Christians still have a hard time accepting the fact that God is no respecter of persons. But it is the truth. You see, God desires all men to be saved and he adopts equally into his family. In Christ alone, people from every race, nationality, economic status, color of skin, and gender, they're all equally blessed with spiritual blessings, all of them that are in Christ. So in Christ, everyone has a common wealth. But in Old Testament times, there were walls of separation, especially between Jew and Gentile. In Old Testament times, Gentiles were aliens from the common wealth of Israel and were without God in the world. But now, Paul says in verse 13, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And notice that in verse 17, Paul even states that Jesus came and preached peace to you who were both near and to those who were far away from God. Now, we think that might be a little strange because we know that Jesus never stepped a foot into the city of Ephesus. And that is where Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesian Christians. And Jesus never went to Ephesus. So how did he preach peace to the people of Ephesus? Well, Jesus preached through the apostles and prophets when he used them in the foundation of the church. You see, Jesus promised his Holy Spirit to the, uh, the apostles who would guide them into all truth. And Jesus kept his promise as we read and study in the book of Acts, he poured his spirit out upon the apostles and the apostles then went and spread the gospel to every nation. So Jesus is still preaching today through his Holy Spirit inspired word of the New Testament. He's preaching the good news of salvation and he's guiding us in ways of righteousness and truth. If we would just listen, he is speaking. And so as Christians go out and preach the gospel into all the world, you know, he, he goes right along with us. He's, he said, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. He says, you go and preach and I'll go with you. So we're not alone. He is right there with us. And part of the message that we preach is the fact that Christ has broken down the barriers between us and God and he's broken down the barriers between us and our fellow man. It's very important that we understand that. The first century world was a lot like our world today in that racial prejudice was a big problem. Our people have a big problem with black and white or Hispanic, or Oriental. Some still have a problem with Jews and Arabs. But the big problem with the first century was Jews versus Gentiles. That wall separation was a high wall. And some wanted it to be a permanent wall. But Jesus broke down that wall. The Great Commission was for the whole world. Yet God had to perform several miracles in Acts chapter 10 before the church would begin to fully obey what Jesus commissioned the church to do all the way back at the end of the Gospels. You see, Jesus wanted to begin a totally new race of people, Christians. In fact, 
God did not even give His people of the New Testament that divine name Christian until after Gentiles were admitted to the church through obedient faith in Christ in Acts chapter 11. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16 states clearly that Jesus abolished the law and the separation between the Gentiles and the Jews that he might create in himself one new man from the two and he reconciled both of them to God in one body, the church, which is also called a holy temple in the Lord in verse 21. Now, everyone on the earth today is a descendant of Noah and his three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. And it's interesting as you study the book of Acts how God leads his people in getting the gospel to all three of these ethnic groups. In Acts 8, an Ethiopian, a descendant of Ham, is brought into God's family through his baptism into Christ. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 9, a Shemite Pharisee named Saul is saved added to the church. In Acts chapter 10, a Japhethite, a Roman centurion from Europe, is converted to Christ. His name Cornelius. So God was hard at work in bringing all races and nationalities into his family. And we should be glad that God is not a racist because most of us, not all of us, but most of us are of European descent, and we would be considered Gentiles and aliens under the Old Testament law. But God was solving an old problem by creating a new man and a new race of men composed of all earthly races. In Christ alone, we share a common wealth. Because our generous Father gives us richly all things to enjoy in Jesus Christ. So, in Christ, we share a common faith. Now remember this passage follows the good news that we talked about last week in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, where we learn that we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, we are not and we cannot be saved by the law. In fact, Galatians 5, 4 says, If you attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Ephesians 2, 15 says, Christ abolished in his flesh the enmity. That is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. He was referring to the Old Testament law that basically separated Jews and Gentiles. The law was good for its purpose. It prepared a people for the coming Messiah. It prepared a nation of people, Israel, for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And God protected the, the line of Christ all the way up until his birth. So it had a, the law had a purpose, but it has fulfilled its purpose. And now we live under the faith of the New Testament and we enjoy the fullness of God's grace in the blood of His sacrificed Son that we sang about today before we partook, partook of these communion elements so we could have a communion, a commonality, and a bonding together with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We all partook of that bread. We all partook of that cup. We all remembered that Jesus died for us all. For every person on the planet, he died for us all. So, thank God, we don't live under the Old Testament law. We live on this side of the cross. And we don't dare add anything to the New Testament. And Jude says that we are to earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. That is the faith that you read about and I read about in the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation. And yet we live in a world where man has constantly added new laws 
and new teachings to the simple faith of the New Testament. And the result is confusion. The result is over 300 different cults and denominations claiming to have the truth of God. It's strange math, but it's always truth. In the faith of Jesus Christ, addition always results in division. God hates division. God hates division. You'll find that in the Old Testament. You'll find it in the New Testament. God hates division. Now, the early church had a problem. The Judaizers in the church wanted to require circumcision, which was a part of the Old Testament law of Moses. They wanted to require circumcision of all the Gentile men who were coming in to the church. So they had to have a conference about it in Jerusalem among the apostles and elders to decide this issue. And in Acts 15, 11, the apostle Peter, whom God used to preach the gospel first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, in Acts 10, Peter spoke and said this, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they, referring to the Gentiles. In other words, Jews and Gentiles alike could be saved in Christ alone, regardless of circumcision or uncircumcision. And Paul went on to, to write later in Galatians that circumcision and uncircumcision avails nothing. What matters is being a new person in Christ. And the new man in Christ shares a common faith. Secondly, the new man shares a common access. Verse 18 says, For through him we both have access, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. The story is told of a preacher who was invited to meet with the President of the United States. It seems this preacher was a good friend to one of the President's close advisors. And this advisor had arranged for his preacher to have a meeting with the president. So the preacher went to the front gate at the White House, and a security guard asked the advisor of the president if this preacher was with him. And the advisor said, yes, he's with me. The security guard let him pass. They came up to the door of the White House. Again, the advisor was asked the same question, is this guy with you? The answer was yes. So they went in the White House. They proceeded to the Oval Office. And the Secret Service agent asked the same question. Again, the answer was, yes, he is with me. And they went in, met with the president. The preacher was amazed. He didn't have to say or do anything. He didn't have to empty his pockets, you know, or take his shoes off or take his coat off. He just, he just said, I'm with that guy. And they went on in. He just needed his friend to testify that he was with him. And the preacher thought that's how we can all gain access to the greatest power of the universe. Just have the right friend testify for you. And Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is a friend who laid down his life to save us from our sins. And he's not just an advisor to the Father. He is the Father's only Son. And He can get you to the Father. In fact, He's the only one who can get you to the Father. He is the only one who has access, full access to the Father. It says in John 14, 6, the Lord Himself, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Me. Now that's either true or it's very arrogant. You and I are here today because we believe it's true. He is the only way to the Father. And if I did not believe that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be somewhere, but I wouldn't be here. All Christians have equal access to the Father through Jesus Christ. And no preacher, elder, deacon, teacher has more right to speak to the Father than you do. If you're in Christ. Thirdly, in Christ we have a common citizenship. Verse 19 says, Now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. 
In the first century, citizenship was a big deal. Being a Roman citizen brought special privileges and blessings to that individual. And Paul, who was a Jew, who became a Christian, but was always a Roman citizen, took advantage of that privileged position and appealed his case when he was arrested by the Jews for causing trouble among the Jews. He appealed his case to Caesar. And he got a free trip to Rome because that was the law for Roman citizens. They could appeal their case to Caesar. And he, didn't, he always wanted to go to Rome. He didn't necessarily want to go as a prisoner, but he got to go. But if Paul was not a Roman citizen, he might have been crucified right there in Acts chapter 22, right there in Jerusalem. You see, citizens receive special treatment. The same is true in our country. Being a citizen of the United States grants me the privilege to vote, to run for public office, to come back to the United States when traveling abroad. It grants me uh, uh, a fair trial if I'm arrested, many others. Uh, it grants me the privilege of paying taxes. Yeah, a lot of privileges. But even more important than being a citizen of the greatest nation on earth is the privilege of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. And all who are in God's kingdom, all of us in God's kingdom are fellow citizens. No longer foreigners or aliens to the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're joint heirs with Christ of all of His inheritance. We have a common wealth. Well, fourthly, in Christ we have a common foundation. Verse 20 says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, 1 Corinthians 3.11 teaches us that Christ is the foundation of the church. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Here, Paul says, the apostles and prophets are the foundation of and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Well, that's not a contradiction. That's easy to harmonize. Very easy. Jesus used the apostles and prophets to lay down the firm foundation of the church through their preaching and teaching the truth about Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the apostle Peter first made that confession in uh, Matthew 16, but soon all the apostles and all the first century prophets believed and taught the very same thing about Jesus Christ. And Jesus said that it was Peter's confession of faith in Christ, the fact that he is the Son of God, that was to be the rock upon which he would build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, Acts 2.42 says, uh, right after the church began, it says the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' teaching. What did they teach? They taught the, they taught the truth about Jesus Christ and His ways. Uh, you, Jesus is the rabbi for the church. He, he is the final authority. He is our peace. If we are building on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, we have a peace amongst ourselves. He gives us the ability to love one another even when we don't agree with one another. He creates in himself a peace and a unity unlike anything else that is on planet Earth. I don't care what club you name, I don't care what lodge you name, I don't care what cult you may name, there's nothing like the peace and unity among God's people in His church. There's a love in His body that the world must stand back and look upon with wonder. Behold how they love one another. The Apostle Peter wrote about it in 1 Peter 1. He says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and in sincere love of the brethren, love one another with a pure heart fervently. Why can we do that? 
How can we do that? By building our lives and His church on the solid foundation of the love of Jesus Christ. We've received it. We want to share it. We want to live it. We want it to permeate our lives and be who we are. Fifthly and finally, in Christ, we have a common building. Verse 21 says, In whom the whole building, being fit together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now we need to understand that for about the first 200 years of church history, the church had really no church buildings that we can find record of. They, they, they weren't building church buildings. Now that doesn't mean that church buildings are wrong. It just means they, in the beginning they didn't have them. Uh, even those who are anti almost everything else are not anti-church buildings. So we understand that a building is just a convenience for the church, uh, for the church to have a place to meet, to work, to worship, to evangelize, to edify, to witness uh, for our Lord. But certainly the church can exist without a building. Uh, we're going to go to Mexico again, and we're going to help on a church building. That's, that's primarily what we do, since we have such a problem with the language problem, but uh, the work can still get done by even people who speak English in a Spanish culture. But the church can exist without a building, but it exists better, in my opinion, and in most people's opinion, it exists better when it has a nice place to meet and to work. So, regardless if the church has a building or not, it's still a holy temple in the Lord. God has chosen out of different economic and ethnic quarries to cut out a people to be living stones to build a spiritual house where His Spirit lives. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5 says, Christ was a living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. And you also, Peter says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. And here's the beauty of it. God uses stones out of different quarries around the world to build himself a beautiful, multicolored temple. Black, white, red, yellow, educated, uneducated, tall, short, fat, skinny, bald, hairy, blonde, brunette, rich, poor, young and old. He puts us all together. All of us are put together in one beautiful, holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22 says, In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God. The dwelling place of God in the Spirit. If you're in Christ, you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit by being baptized into Christ and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so you are a part of this beautiful building of God, the temple of God of the New Testament, the church of Jesus Christ. And you have a common wealth. You share a common foundation. You have a common access. You have a common citizenship, a common foundation, and a common building in the Spirit. If you are in Christ, God has graciously given to you all of these blessings and more. And all you have to do to receive these gifts and have this inheritance is surrender your life in faith, in obedient faith to Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 26 and 27, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So let me ask you, have you been baptized into Christ? Have you surrendered your life to Him? Do you have 
All the spiritual blessings that are all wrapped up in Jesus. We're going to sing our invitation hymn and give you the opportunity to come today and make Jesus your Lord. It'll be the best decision you have ever made. You can come just as you are, but in faith and in repentance, He will receive you. Will you come to Jesus as we stand and sing, just as I am? God's Word, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that uh, without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently, carefully, and persistently seek Him. So thank you for seeking the Lord. I pray you'll always seek Him, make Him first, priority one in your life, and He will bless you with all good gifts. And the best gifts of all are those that are found in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's where all spiritual blessings are. You might notice some of these gray t-shirts here that uh, Delaney's wearing. We're blessed to be a blessing. That's right out of Genesis chapter 12. And our kids are going to be competing this afternoon. We've got kids coming here from churches across all over eastern Kentucky to compete in the middle chapters of the book of Genesis in a Bible Bowl competition. So we're going to have a great afternoon with our young people. Uh, we will have evening service tonight at 6 o'clock, and we invite you to, to be back at that time. So it's so, so good to have everybody, all of our visitors and guests. Thank you all for being with us today, and uh, I'd like to ask Brother Alex DeSalvo to lead us in our closing prayer. <laughs> 